Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. On Thursday, Pope Francis spoke to a joint session of the U.S. Congress. Here's a little clip of some of what he had to say. Business is a noble vocation directed to producing wealth, wealth and improving the world. It can be a fruitful source of prosperity from the area in which it operates, especially if it sees the creation of jobs as an essential part of its service to the common good. So the Pope is saying business is a noble profession, especially if it creates jobs. Um, this is somewhat short of what he apparently intended to say in the speech that was released uh, by the Vatican ahead of time in print. There was a section there that he didn't read. Uh, that section goes like this. Uh, if politics must truly be at the service of the human person, it follows that it cannot be a slave to the economy and finance. Um, that is a heck of a lot stronger than business is a noble profession. Uh, go further, in 2013, the Pope, in one of his major statements, said, while the earnings of a minority are growing exponentially, so too is the gap separating the majority from prosperity, enjoyed by those happy few. This imbalance is the result of ideologies which defend the absolute autonomy of the marketplace and financial speculation. A little further down, he says, a new tyranny is thus born, invisible and often virtual, but which unilaterally and relentlessly imposes its own laws and rules. Strong words of condemnation of the current system. Well, now joining us to talk about the Pope's address in Congress, first of all, is Chris Williams. He's a professor at Pace University in New York City at the Department of Chemistry and Physical Science. He's also the author of Ecology and Socialism, Socialist Solutions to Capitalist Ecological Crisis. Also joining us is Nancy Shepard Hughes. She's a chancellor professor of medical anthropology at the University of California at Berkeley. She's the author of several books, including Death Without Weeping, The Violence of Everyday Life in Brazil. And she's followed a lot of the work of the Catholic Church in Latin America. In April 2015, she was invited to the Vatican, a Vat Vatican plenary session on human trafficking. Thank you both for joining us. Thanks, Ari. Uh, Chris, let, let me start with you first, and a little bit of the politics of this. I, I was really quite wondering, why the heck did the Speaker of the House, Boehner, invite the Pope anyway? Um, his, his rhetoric, uh, in terms of critiquing the excesses of capitalism, uh, is, is as strong as any European Social Democrat has delivered in a long time. Um, and in Europe, perhaps not such radical language, although maybe these days even there, but in the U.S. Congress, it's pretty radical. Now, as I, I think I pointed out, it was somewhat much more muted uh, as delivered to Congress, but still everyone knows what the Pope's been saying. But the Pope uh, called again for the abolishment of capital punishment. This conviction has has led me from the beginning of my ministry to advocate on different levels the global abolition of the death penalty. He was muted on the environment, but yesterday at the White House he was stronger. Um, what the heck was in it for the Republicans to have give him such a stage? Um, it's a good question. I, I mean, one third of Congress is uh, our Catholic, so um, and obviously it's a big constituency in the United States, and it is the first time a Pope has addressed uh, Joint House of Congress. So, in many ways, it's an historic thing that uh, they also want to show, uh, despite the problems with um, differences with his stance on immigration, most notably, and the death penalty. Um, that they can bring them, bring the Pope in and, and have him speak to them. And they knew, I'm sure, that he would use the occasion to be more muted and wouldn't make his, his uh, criticisms of capitalism, comments on the, on the environment as pointed and direct as he did yesterday um, and was much more diplomatic in, in most of his uh, comments. And 
to the extent that who knows why he left out the the, the stronger language that you quoted earlier. Right. Uh, Nancy, uh, we talk about his criticism of capitalism, but it's not he doesn't propose an alternative to capitalism. He proposes an alternative, I guess, to the uh, more rapacious type of capitalism. Um, where does that sit? Is this a radical departure from, in terms of church doctrine? Is he really the radical pope? Or is this a pope that badly needs to kind of repair the reputation of the church, especially in Latin America, uh, even in the United States, amongst poor Hispanics, that, that, that he needs to come out with a kind of social democratic type of language to, to sort of strengthen his own institution? Well, I think that uh, the language he's used is very common in the past is what we call vulture capitalism or corporate capitalism or uh, global capitalism, which he very much sees as a, a grave danger to poor people. And, uh, but I think that he realizes you can't say vulture capitalism to American Congress. They wouldn't understand. Why he says business is an honorable profession is because he's thinking about small businesses. People that run little shops or, you know, uh, small rest houses, whatever. Uh, that's the kind of business he's talking about. He's not talking about corporate finance, which he believes is a, a grievous mortal sin. Uh, but he, I, I'm sure he's been, uh, you know, told that uh, Americans don't understand this kind of story. I mean, he's called capitalism a porcaria. Now, I don't want to say there's many translations of porcaria, but uh, one of the words begins with S and ends with T. I mean, he has used very, very strong language in condemning the kind of capitalism that has created the rift between North and South and has created, he believes, um, human uh, trafficking and forced migrations of people. Uh, so he is very anti uh the kind of capitalism that the Republicans seem to be supportive, and I would say the Democrats too. He's a Latin American. Um, he was not so radical, as you well know, you know, when he was head of the Jesuits, when he was a young man, he was very frightened of this language, of liberation theology, and of the revolutions that were being fermented in South America and in Central America. And he put a real damper on it. And, you know, he not only, um, you know, had problems with some of his Jesuits, there were many, many poor people who were catechists uh, of liberation theology who were dropped in the Rio Plata River. And uh, I think he's, in my writings and my understanding of him, is that uh, he really is trying to make amends for his failures to understand that uh, militant military governments that were combined with very, very strong financial global capitalist interests uh, was something that really uh, divided the world and uh, also had bad effects on the environment, our home, as he calls right. it. And he sees these as all related. It's one large picture for him. But is it also, and I'm not trying to question his sincerity or not, yeah. but, but in terms of the, his defense of the institution of the Catholic Church, is, does the church not have to go in this direction if it doesn't want to become marginalized in Latin America, given the leftward tilt of where most people are headed? Well, I don't think Latin America is necessarily all leftward uh, leaning at all. I mean, there are... Well, amongst the, I agree, of course it's not, but amongst ordinary people, there's certainly been a gravitation that way the last few well, years. Well, among the ordinary people, many of whom are very poor um, and who are very smart and have been trained in everything from Paulo Freire to Foucault, I'll tell you, I've met in my life more illiterate peasants and people living in shanty towns and favelas who are politically astute and uh, they can talk about uh, Gramsci and they can talk about uh, Franz Fanon and Paulo Freire and they are angry and they, you know they want their time has to come and uh, you know so their language is very very strong. But that's sort of my point that the Pope again I'm not going to question yeah. whether he believes it or let's assume yeah. he does but institutionally the church needs to talk like this to gain credibility in Latin America? Well, 
I don't think that's true because I think that there's uh, the church has also, for example, uh, uh, the majority of many of the small parishes and churches are following more evangelical uh, ways of reaching people. Pentecostal Catholicism is what I often see at the base. That is the idea to tap into emotions and to tap into individual change. And he's talking a socialist language here. And I don't think that's the language necessarily of the masses in Latin America. I think that he's developing his own path to a kind of democratic socialism, I guess. But that's, he's beyond those kinds of, he hates those sort of ideological uh, descriptors of what he is. But uh, you could win more Catholics in Latin America by, uh, by speaking in tongues than you can by speaking of Marx today. Mm. Mm. Chris, uh, w when you look at the Pope's language on the environment, um, I, you can kind of make two arguments, I think. One is for climate deniers, and many of whom sit in the U.S. Congress, at least they purport to be deniers, um, and represent a whole section of American society that it, it doesn't outright deny it, certainly doesn't think climate change is an urgent pr problem. Um, and he seems his language seems to have opened up some space there in, in terms of the position he took or is taking. On the other hand, he sits next to President Obama, and who's, who's with some exceptions with some small regulation, has mostly been pushing or promoting various methods of financialization in order to supposedly deal with climate change. Um, so, so how do you assess the, the effect of the Pope's words in terms of the debate that's going on in the United States? I think it's huge. I think it's huge around the world. Um, there are a billion Catholics, and now the Pope has spoken, and this will be talked and debated uh, and has to be taken up by the entirety of the Catholic Church all over the planet. And that poses uh, the greatest problem in the United States, of course, where he's visiting, where, as you mentioned, most of Congress uh, either don't believe in climate change or don't believe that it's uh, caused by us, both of which the Pope has written uh, about. Um, uh, or maybe they do believe it, but they don't really do anything meaningful about it. Because uh, the other thing about Congress is, for the first time, this Congress is a majority of millionaires. And so they are exactly the kind of rich people that the Pope is condemning in his other writings. Um, and so I, I think that this is a huge opening for the left, for, for environmentalists, for everybody to uh, start a new conversation about what, he, what is the Pope saying. He's saying that if we are going to get any kind of ecological justice change to protect the planet, we can only do so if we get social change at the same time. In other words, this is just as much about uh, a question of social justice, more so about social justice, than it really is about technological changes. And so that is a huge statement for somebody who sits as the representative of God on Earth uh, at the head of uh, a multi-billion dollar organization, otherwise known as the Catholic Church. Well, what do, so, what do you make of the critique of exactly that, that this is a multi-billion dollar corporation? As far as I know, and people we've talked to, they've not made, like, for example, any divestments in fossil fuel, and that it's a very kind of, again, it's a, it's a way to kind of make the institution look modern and relevant, but if, it do, if he doesn't call for more specific kinds of measures, like for example, I don't know, maybe he has and I'm not aware of, you can tell me, specific, for example, regulation versus financialization as a method, like instead of cap and trade, serious regulation, if he doesn't get into the weeds on some of that stuff, does it actually just create room for kind of neoliberal ways of dealing with climate change, which most people think aren't going to be very effective? Um, no, they're certainly not, and they're likely to make things much worse. Um, actually, he, he has said some things about, about that. He has called cap and trade um, unsuccessful and the wrong way to do, go about um, bringing about emissions reductions, which is what we are supposed to be doing, So and is so urgently necessary. So the fact that he's called it urgently necessary. He said that the market, the deified market in, in the language that he used, untrammeled uh, free market capitalism uh, as a pile of dung um, is, uh, is, is another significant um, feature of, of the encyclical that he wrote and of his comments. So 
uh, the idea of financialization and, and neoliberal market solutions to the environment is something that uh, he is against. Um, but to what extent the kind of structural imbalances and injustices are really going to be tackled through a moral framework is questionable because um, it's not just a question of morals, it's also a question of politics. And clearly, uh, if we actually did do make meaningful change with regard to climate change, with, with regard to the refugee crisis, with regard to racism, ending the death penalty, how are those, how are those things gonna, gonna actually happen? And I think that's what's significant. The fact that he, he uh, mentioned uh, Dorothy Day, who is a socialist, uh, member of the uh, uh, IWW, and who also had an abortion, um, is significant in terms of it's really through struggles like she engaged with and through uh, struggles that Martin Luther King obviously engaged with that uh, we're going to make progress. And it's only through those kind of social struggles. So is the Pope open to that kind of uh, level where the masses take to the streets and we self-organize for the kind of uh, change that we need? I think that's really the only solution, but I think that would be asking a little bit much of the Pope. But I, I would I would stress that it's also uh, very much a political question because we're not all going to gain from uh, a, a kinder, more equal society. Right. The people at the top are going to be losing out, yeah. um, right. and many of them are in Congress. Nancy, how the the stronger language of the Pope on both in terms of his critique of capitalism, on the environment, and some of the other issues. How much is this making it? down to local churches well in the United States and then, then say in Latin America? Well, I think that the church is a very uh, divided church. And uh, I, I, I know that uh, within the Holy See and in the Vatican, as well as in Latin America, there's a lot of grumpiness about what is this pope going to say next? What is he going to do? Um, so uh, I think that a lot of what he's doing right now, even in tempering his language, as he did, I think, with the uh, abortion jubilee, you know, forgiveness for all the women who wish to confess that they had an abortion, to feminist is like, oh, gosh, this is a double bind, okay? I mean, we have to admit that this was a mortal sin, and then we've got to give confession, and, you know, then for one year, you know, we we could be brought back, you know, into um, into communion with with the church. I think that he was doing this to to prepare the uh, old cardinals and the bishops, and to say that you know we'll have more to say about this. And I and I also I was going to make the point that Dorothy Day uh, was a, a muted um, example of a woman who was a communist uh, for a while who had a child outside of marriage, who had an abortion, who got married and left her husband, and she became, uh, gave her life to social justice, essentially, in the Lower East Side. She produced The Catholic Worker, which had a hammer and a sickle on it. Uh, my mom and dad, who were immigrants, uh, my grandmother, grandpa, and whatever, uh, were very, very Catholic, but we always had at our dinner table that one cent copy of the Catholic worker. So uh, the fact that he brought her up, even though as she became older, her work was again somewhat more modified. She became a pacifist and was arrested many times. But I could not believe what I heard. I was a Catholic worker for several years and uh, got to meet her once or twice in the Lower East Side. but helped founded the uh, the Berkeley Catholic worker and on her principle it was a shock to me that the that Dorothy Day's name was listed among uh, the four great Americans that he wanted to uh, honor yeah, in the same paragraph with Abraham Lincoln yes right and Martin Luther King and Thomas Merton uh, you know that wasn't such a surprise uh, given the um, powerful role that Thomas Merton had in bridging religions and in introducing Zen Buddhism, both Chinese and Japanese Zen Buddhism to, to Americans. So each of the persons that he chose follows one of his paths. And he always says, pray for me, right? And then he added with a little smile on his face and he said, and those of you who can pray, don't pray or don't believe, please send me your good wishes.
so he really is trying to create this very, very open um, a theology that is beyond theology. That is, he loves talking to atheists, to secularists, to whatever. He wants to know. He wants to get close to people. He wants to understand them on the ground. He's kind of an existentialist, I would say. Mm. All right, we're going to have to wrap it up. Thanks very much, Chris. Thank you, Nancy. Okay. Thank you. Th thank you very much for joining us on The Real News Network.